Before we begin, since this is a BBC-owned property, I feel the need to point out that the news arm of the BBC has a continuing issue with transphobic leanings in its news coverage. You can find in a pinned comment below various videos from both myself and other YouTubers covering this issue. And while I understand that the Doctor Who creative team is not responsible for this, I will continue to point this out for as long as it remains a consistent issue. Thank you. I've got news for you. This lighthouse is under attack and by morning we might all be dead. <laughs> Anyone interested? Yeah, that's uh, a <laughs> that's a strong pitch. Yeah, I busted the cap out. I didn't feel like dealing with my hair today. That's the mood I'm in. But you know what picked up my mood a little bit? Dipping into some classic Who. It's been a it's been a while. I know it kind of fell off uh, the radar a little bit. It is my intention in the new year to make this a regular monthly feature again. So that's what we're aiming for right now. I'm not going to make promises. I did announce it as a plan, though, so that probably means something will break. But uh, given that we are in the month of October, I thought it I was overdue to check out The Horror of Fang Rock. So this is a fourth Doctor, Tom Baker story. The companion in this one is Leela, who I have seen in one other story. It was Image of Fendel. Um, is the only other one I've seen her in. And this is one that I know a little bit by reputation because it's often one that comes up when people cite kind of how dark <laughs> Doctor Who got for a stretch in there. So uh, I was really curious to check this one out. And I should have realized right off the bat that I was in for a good time because Terrence Dix wrote this. And Terrence Dix, he was real good at writing Doctor Who. He really really was. Rest in peace, man. Oh, you did such good work. So what this is, is this is actually an incredibly self-contained uh, functional. Here's the thing. If you break it down, it's functionally a base under siege story, but it doesn't really feel like most base under siege stories because the emphasis is so much on atmosphere and it's going for a much more kind of gothic horror vibe feel aesthetic and also time period because it's set kind of towards the early part of the 20th century so this is all set at a uh at sort of a rocky point called fang rock and there's a lighthouse there three-man crew of people banning the lighthouse they just barely got uh, an electric light in it used to be the old oil lights um so there's one of them's an older guy who you was used to the oil. There's a, there's a very young, very new guy. And there's a guy kind of in the middle who's, you know, all up to date on the electrical stuff. Uh, the doctor and Leela show up um, accidentally, which was the way that the doctor usually ended up where he ended up, especially back in classic. It was just like, oh, this isn't quite right. Well, let's check it out anyways. Well, uh, slightly before they arrived, there was some kind of light in the sky that then landed in the water. And now a fog has rolled in, a fog that really shouldn't be there. And uh, so that's our initial setup. And then uh, we get more people added in as, be as because uh, electricity and power gets drained from the lighthouse and a ship crashes. And there are four survivors from that. So we have four people in the single location, the lighthouse and the immediate surrounding area. Something is going on. People are starting to die. There's a weird green light that we see. What's going on? That's a good setup. That's a good, solid, atmospheric setup. And this really does recreate that feel very well. The, the cast is quite good. Everyone's pulling their weight uh, with the guest cast, even when they don't necessarily have a lot uh, to work with in terms of their characterization. I feel bad for the actress who had to play this sort of secretary figure, although she was part of one of the moments that I did laugh out loud at, which is that um, when Leela says that they're going to have to fight this thing, that woman immediately faints. And then cut to Leela and she rolls her eyes. It's great. I suppose I'll pause and talk about Leela. She's real good in this. Uh, the, the dynamic and the back and forth between her and the doctor is really well developed here in terms of like the amount that she does understand. And sometimes she'll make these leaps that don't quite go where they're supposed to. But the doctor is generally pretty understanding with her and seems to really appreciate how warrior like she is, like she pulls a knife on a guy and threatens to cut his heart out and then cuts back to the doctor who's just smiling. 
<laughs> it's kind of funny. Like, I, I, I kind of make the assumption that he knows she wouldn't actually do that unless the guy attacked her first. Um, she wouldn't actually do that as an active thing, so he's kind of okay with it and just rather likes having an, uh, someone who's going to go that hard on an idiot. So um, that was that was nice. And, like, just just their moments back and forth, they, uh, they work really well. Tom Baker's also in top form in this. He has his moments where he's loose and kind of silly. He'll like, he'll, he'll hear something. He'll start to talk. He'll go off and change it. Suddenly rock it back to the first thing and go, wait a minute. What do you mean by this? Um, and you know, he has that affability, but he also has some moments in here where he gets harsh. He has this one moment where he shouts down actually that, um, that same poor woman who job was to be hysterical a little bit. I suppose, uh, I suppose Leela's the counterbalance to that. But, um, you know, the doctor really snaps at her at one point, and it was, it was kind of scary. Like, Tom Baker had a real sense of authority when he wanted to. And the general progression of the thing is just, it unfolds really well. Uh, the effects are surprisingly good up to a point. Um, the, there's the, the blue screen, actually, this is some of the best blue screen that I've seen Doctor Who use. It's used way more sparingly, and it just looks way, way better than what I'm used to seeing on Doctor Who. The, there's also model work, which I rather liked. Is it super convincing model work? No, insofar as I could immediately tell. It was model work, but it was nice model work. It was aesthetically pleasing model work. So I was down for that as well. If there's a visual hiccup, it's the eventual reveal of the thing behind everything going on. That, that is, um, uh, let me put it this way. They really should have left it at like us never seeing it and just have like a glowing green light that surrounds it, but we never get a good look at it. That would have, that actually really would have worked well with the tone of this thing, but we do see it. And actually in the last episode, we see it a fair bit. And it's, I like, I like the concept of it. I like the concept of what we're dealing with a lot. And I'll talk in a little more detail about that after I give a spoiler warning. But, like, the actual visual execution of it is, is, mm, mm -mm. it's, not, it's not there. It's just, it's not. But I gotta say, um, this one just has that harshness to it without it feeling as intrusive as it did with, like, some of the Colin Baker ones that were shockingly violent to me at times. This one, for lack of a better way to put it, is just classier about it because like so there's a character who dies early on their body goes missing that body gets recovered and brought back in and the we don't see it we don't get a good look at it but the way other characters react when they see it and the way they talk about it and the fact that it was basically pulled apart so that something out there could learn what humans were like and how they work that and like there's like a tiny little bit when the bodies move where you see a little bit of blood but just the way that they act around that makes it very clear that while it's not going to be shown this is a viscerally upsettingly gory thing that has happened and that beats the heck out of what was going on with Colin Baker a little bit later on I will just say that up front um and then like the actual body count on the, this thing's this thing's pretty brutal uh, ultimately, and I can I can see why it is uh, often cited as um, as sort of being emblematic of a darker time in Doctor Who, and in terms of uh, how far it went to be scary at times. Was I scared? No, no, I wasn't. But it really did nail the atmosphere, and I wouldn't blame anyone who saw this at a young age and was scared by it. I might have been. If I'd seen it at like six, seven. But as an adult, I just have a real good time with it. Like I say, all the performances are good. There's there's actually 
a surprising amount of nuance and depth to the characters. You know, I went off on the secretary, but, you know, you've got a different dynamic from each of the three guys who are manning the lighthouse. You've got uh, a sailor who has a different feel from the, the guy who owned the ship, who has a different feel from this colonel who is, you know, of the same sort of gentry level stature, but they're also distinct. Like, this is a this is a well-rounded cast of characters, all well played. The doctor's on point. Leela's working really well. The atmosphere is terrific. I am going to talk a little bit about spoilers uh, in specific. So if you haven't seen it yet, if you like classic Doctor Who, this is a good one. This is a good one. So like, check it out. Um, spoilers now coming. So I guess this is the only time we ever see the Rutans. Um, or Rutons. I think it, it seemed to vary depending on who was saying it. Um, but these are the species that the Sontarans are constantly at war with, uh, which gets referenced later on by David Tennant in series four. But this is the only time we see them, and it's just a, kind of a round green blob that apparently also has tentacles. The number of times they showed the shot of that thing pulling itself up the stairs, it was... <laughs> It was not intimidating at all. Um, and it was a shame because when it was just, there was just this green light or you just saw a uh, thing from its point of view, which was a very typical Doctor Who, um, you know, tactic at the time. That actually works quite well. But then you see and it's like, oh, oh, that's what it is. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not nervous anymore, like at all. But uh, I, I was still really interesting to see and sort of get that piece. And like, this is a full cast death. Every, every character who is not the doctor and Leela is dead by the end of it. That's what I meant when I said this thing is kind of brutal. And I think they tried to get away with it by e evoking classic literature. I forget the, the name of the poem or the poet, but, um, apparently Terrence Dix took some inspiration from, this poem about an incident of where there were three lighthouse keepers who just vanished and no one ever knew what happened to them. And the doctor like quotes from it at the very end. So I think maybe they were hoping they could get away with it if they could pretend it was a, it was a literary reference or a literary adaptation. But this boy, this thing does not mess around. It's good though. It's a good time. And actually very appropriate. I'd say for October. So if you want to, like, set aside a, a classic Doctor Who story for the spookier time of year, yeah, this 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 will slot into that really well. The Horror of Fang Rock. Have you seen it? What did you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon is what pays the bills. Um, and if I can stick with doing this at a regular basis, um, there will be polls to determine future classic who reviews not you know basically just trying to decide what what is the next one although i do have one planned for next month we'll see how that uh if i can get that to work but I, after that i'll start having polls um and any amount of support will allow you to vote in the polls but even if you can't do that uh the like share subscribe also help me out don't worry too much about it though take a relaxed attitude around here so you can come on back next time you need a break All right, time to thank my highest supporting patrons, Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfulla, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Oliver B., Melinda Walters, Imu Delki, Leotha Boyd, Toy Loli, Becky Sparks, Phrenobulax, The Poodle, Zach, Bookworm, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Adam R.D.L. Taylor, Shayla Gourlay, Brendan LaRose, and T.T. Thank you for your support. If you want to hear me try and say your name while this little guy tries to chew on my earrings, well, you can check out the Patreon or the support tiers that get you a shout out. Thanks so much. You are a pain in my butt.